This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. It is indeed my great honor to be standing here today to officiate the launch of the first Harvest Distinguished Women Lecture Series. It is with pleasure that I'm revisiting my alma mater because this place does have a special meaning in my heart because this was where the harvest seed was sown. Well, here let me share with you my wedding poem which was unveiled on May 21st, 1994, entitled Harvest of the Vines of Love. The first verse read like this. Two, no, one beautiful morning by the Sather Gate, two Berkeley freshmen met by fate. And the ending verse read like this. Both are spiritually encouraged that only true love and trust will allow the 1985 vintage to yield a fruitful harvest. So indeed, today, 28 years later, my husband Harvey and I, also known as Harvest when our names are combined, are here to launch the Harvest Distinguished Lecture Series. We're so proud to be reuniting with Sathergate, reconnecting with Cal for a meaningful harvest, and this time is related to education and international goodwill. Well, as a mother of two young daughters, and as the founder of my own public relations company, which has served a lot of women brands and products over the past 18 years, as the director of Zonta Club of Hong Kong, whose aim is to elevate the social, economic, and education status of women, and also as the general committee member of my high school alma mater, Diocese and Girls School, as an active mentor and director for the Golden Bohemia Women Entrepreneurs Association in Hong Kong, also the uh, Woman of Influence Board of the French Chamber of Commerce, and also, you know, I was uh, actually the guest speaker for many women forums, and on the lighter side of life, I was one of the founding members of Femme de Van Society, which is to promote the appreciation and education of wine among women. I could more or less label myself as a true activist of women issues and interests, a strong supporter of women's education and equality, and also a passionate promoter of some of the more popular women and beauty brands from my notable clients, such as Lancome, Biotherm, The Body Shop, Neutrogena, Dior, Shiseido, to name a few. So when Dean Zeri and Mr. Nakayama approached me almost a year ago in Hong Kong to offer me this endowment opportunity, it didn't take me long to accept the offer, which is to endow a distinguished woman lecture series featuring influential women around the world as guest speakers to speak on different topics evolving around the following, but not limited to economics or education, philanthropy or diplomacy, arts or culture, PR or marketing, entrepreneurship or leadership, uh, sports, parenting, family values, or even food and wine. And here I am today you know, to reap the fruitful harvest of presenting the inaugural Harvest Distinguished Women Lecture Series, where Mrs. Harriet Fulbright is the inaugural guest speaker. 
Mrs. Fulbright, on behalf of the 53 Fulbright Scholars in Hong Kong since the year 2003, I sincerely wish to thank you for your kind support to make many education dreams come true. And also on behalf of my client, the Lee Heisen Foundation, I also like to thank you for your kind sponsorship of the Lee Heisen Foundation Fulbright Hong Kong Scholar Award Program, which was launched last year to allow PhD students to engage in Fulbright educational experiences in the US for four years in a row. And since yesterday we actually was the deadline for application of many Hong Kong scholars. I hereby would also like to wish everyone the best of luck in being awarded the Fulbright Scholarship so that they can also, you know, broaden the cross-cultural learning and sharing. They can develop the global awareness and, of course, foster international goodwill. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming the influential, quintessential woman leader in education, diplomacy, humanities, and the arts, Mrs. Harriet Mayer Fulbright. It's a real pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I hope. In the world today, thanks to modern technolo technology in the form of the rapid means of transportation and highly developed forms of instant communication, the education of both young and old outside their familiar settings has become so widespread that it is something sometimes hard for us to remember what life was like before it was so easy to move from one continent to another in a matter of hours, pick up the telephone and speak to a friend or relative on the other side of the world, or turn on the television set and watch events a continent away while they're still happening. What is heartening is that along with these developments, we have seen a measurable decrease in wars, both big and small. One of the strongest deterrents to martial mayhem is, in my view, the rapid growth of collaborative activity in the form of studies and research, of aid, and of proponents and supporters of international education exchange. In this country, one of the greatest advocates of this <clears throat> means of encouraging understanding between differing societies was a man named J. William Fulbright. And his background might give you a better understanding of why and how he established the program bearing his name, which has spread over 155 countries around the world and changed the lives of countless people. How this happened is an interesting story. It's the tale of a man who used his experience and intellect to create something for the benefit of the whole world and in no small way to change the course of human history. While this heightened respect for and understanding of other ways of living and thinking have not eliminated all fighting among all nations, it certainly has created slow, uh, slowed the rush to battle when disagreements or misunderstandings arise between nations. J. William Fulbright was born in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the middle child in a family of five. When he became a teenager, his father decided that he should do something useful his summer vacation and sent him to work on a farm. Most of his days were spent working in the fields where he became not only truly hot and tired, but covered with chaff by the end of each day. The next summer, he was given the choice of more farm work or summer school. 
and I'm sure you can guess what he chose. As a result, he finished high school a year early and entered the University of Arkansas. Now, Bill Fulbright was a lively young man who was both intelligent and athletic. While in college, he did equally well in his studies and on the sports field, ending up on the University of Arkansas's football team. Very few people know that. His English teacher, who took a special interest in him, talked with him often, and asked about his plans for the future when he became a senior. I don't know, was the answer. I haven't gotten given it much thought. Apply for the Rhodes Scholarship, his teacher replied. So Fulbright looked into it, and he was intrigued. The requirements were threefold. The applicant had to show proof of his ability to excel, not only academically, but in athletics as well. And furthermore, he had to give some indication of his leadership potential. Now, Bill had very good grades. He was on the college football team. And in his senior year, he was class president. So he applied, and he was accepted as a Rhodes Scholar. After spending the summer with his family and preparing for his trip to England, he took a train east to New York City to board the ship across the Atlantic. Now, having grown up in a town where the population was measured in thousands, New York was a true shock that he never forgot, nor did he ever grow to like it. I was born there. <laughs> but the boat ride from there to England was pleasant, and he arrived at Oxford ready to begin his new life. When, while he admitted that his studies with his English tutor were most, the most challenging of his life, he really liked Professor McCallum, and he enjoyed the work. Upon creation, completion, of his scholarship, he spent a short time sightseeing in Europe and then returned to the United States, landing in Washington, DC. A meeting with a very attractive, intelligent young lady named Betty persuaded him to spend more time in the area. So he entered the George Washington University Law School. Kind of funny reason for doing that, but it turned out well. <laughs> Within the next two years, he was married, and he earned a law degree. Back in Arkansas, after graduation, he accepted a position at the University of Arkansas's law school and taught there for several years until one of his former students came to visit him. The young man had held a seat in the US House of Representatives, and he had decided not to run in the next election, but he wanted to make sure that his place would be filled by somebody he respected and would do a good job for his state. It's time you put your money where your mouth is, he told Fulbright. During your tenure as professor of constitutional law, <clears throat> You constantly reminded your classmates that democracy only works if the best and the brightest run for office. Now, I can assure you that it is a very rewarding experience. But I am now moving on to other work. And I want to make sure that my seat will be taken by someone worthy of this office. In other words, I'm here to persuade you to take my place. Well. After consulting his wife, Betty, he decided that his former student had made a compelling argument. So he took the challenge, and he won the House seat for Arkansas. A little over a year later, one of the US senators from Arkansas announced his intention to retire from office. Very shortly, a fellow Arkansan that Fulbright did not have respect for announced his candidacy for the position of senator. So he immediately decided to run for the Senate seat 
himself. It was a hard fought battle, but well worth it in his mind, and he won. As senator, Fulbright was a practical, hardworking, studious, and unassuming person. One who liked to get things done without worrying about credit or ceremony. One example of his attitude and actions occurred early in the 1960s while on a trip to Costa Rica with President Kennedy and a group of his Senate colleagues. On reaching their destination, there was a good deal of confusion over who should travel to town in which limousine, and the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, namely Fulbright, was inadvertently left behind at the airport. Now, I am sure that there were other vehicles that could have taken him to town had he put up enough of a fuss, but no. He quietly asked for directions to San Juan and walked the four miles to the city. It was exceedingly hot and dusty, <clears throat> but in about an hour, he entered the U.S. Embassy where he found a pile of baggage belonging to the group. Missing, however, was his briefcase. Oh, a young Foreign Service officer said when he was asked about it, I locked the briefcase with your confidential papers in the top secret case. For the first time, Fulbright raised his voice. Top secret? You locked my toothbrush and my shaving kit? <laughs> now, practical and unassuming does not mean ordinary. That word did not ever fit this man. As soon as he <clears throat> assumed his Senate seat, he was a person constantly in search of unusual ideas which could be of benefit to his constituency, ideas beyond, beyond commonplace or the accepted practice, or the habits and traditions of the present day. One of his Foreign Relations Committee staff members remembers picking up the phone during his first week on the job and was startled to hear the chairman on the other end of the line demand, well, have you got any ideas? The poor man was completely tongue-tied until he finally realized that new ideas were exactly what the chairman wanted. New, untried, unthinkable, even outrageous ideas. In 1964, Fulbright put it this way, we must dare to think unthinkable thoughts. We must learn to explore all the options and possibilities that confront us in a complex and rapidly changing world. We must learn to welcome and not to fear the voices of dissent. We must dare to think about unthinkable things because when things become unthinkable, thinking stops and actions become mindless. Now, one of the thoughts many of his colleagues considered unthinkable was the International Education Exchange Program that bears his name. It was during the Second World War when Fulbright, as was his habit, was trying to get to the root cause of the conflict. Now, why in the world was the world at war for the second time in less than two generations? After a good deal of thought and study, he came to the conclusion that it was simply because we, the people of the world, did not know each other. We needed to spend meaningful amounts of time together in each other's countries, getting to know differing modes of thought and communication, 
differing ways of interacting socially, better ways of resolving differences among ourselves and solving problems. Unthinkable thoughts, however, does not mean hasty or unthought through actions on the part of a democracy's leadership. On the contrary, leadership requires the ability to find tried and true ways and means to open the eyes of the populace and expand their horizons. The ability to elevate the whole community's critical thinking skills and sense of responsibility so as to feel comfortable with and flourish <clears throat> under that which is the great universal golden ring to societies around the globe, namely freedom, which he described in this way. If ever a universal victory for democratic values comes within reach, it will come, I believe, not through acts of foreign policy and certainly not through military policy, but rather through the magnetism of freedom itself. The prospects for freedom depend ultimately on how it is practiced in free societies. Now, Fulbright went on to say what, <clears throat> that whenever he could, that in <clears throat> order to ensure prosperity for all members of a free country, those who live in a democracy must be educated and educated broadly, both in their own <clears throat> and in other countries. His most famous piece of legislation has extended an educational experience beyond national borders for scholars from over 155 different countries around the world. That was based, as you can see, on his own firsthand experience as a Rhodes Scholar and proposed out of a sense of urgency derived from the certain knowledge that the atomic bomb spelled the end of the human race completely should there ever be another world war. Fulbright knew that the majority of his colleagues would not approve of any money spent on such an idea. So the first bill he sent through the Senate outlined an international education exchange program, but made no mention of money needed to make it a reality. As a result, that bill passed easily without any argument. Why should anybody worry about it? Once that was accomplished, he then very nervously searched for a way to pay for it, but did not have to wait long for an answer. Within weeks, coming through the Senate was a proposal to sell to Europe all the war materials left unused all over the continent after the fighting stopped. The U.S. no longer needed them, and war-torn Europe certainly could put them to good use. Fulbright studied the bill and thought, aha. So he added at the bottom one sentence. The proceeds from these goods shall be limited in use to underwrite the International Education Exchange Program. He sent the bill on without comment. And nobody really read it. It passed easily. <laughs> this assured the birth of the International Education Exchange Program, which bears his name. Six months later, one of his colleagues came over to him and shook his finger in his face and yelled, young man, don't you realize how dangerous it is to expose our fine young girls and boys to those terrible foreign isms? Well, clearly he didn't. 
This international education program, which bears his name, has opened the eyes and minds of not only students around the world, but professors and those in needs of special technical training unavailable in their countries. In its whole existence, it has cost the American taxpayer less than a week of our defense program at the present time. And despite the relatively small financial outlay, it is recognized as one of the strongest forces for peace on the planet, thanks to its role in spreading and deepening a real understanding of differing cultures throughout the world. As Fulbright put it in his usual succinct way, education is a slow-moving but powerful force. It may not be fast enough or strong enough to save us from catastrophe, but it is the strongest force available. The success of the International Education Exchange Program around the world is now clear. Not only do countless thousands of students declare that their studies in a different country fundamentally change their understanding of their world and their outlook on it, their aspirations, and therefore their lives, but more people than I could possibly count have told me that they met their spouses while on the program, thus deepening even more the will to keep the peace worldwide. This has some, has some saying that Fulbright's second role in life is that of Cupid. Education exchange has been proven to be the best and possibly the only means by which nations can cultivate a degree of obje objectivity about each other's behavior and intentions. It is the means by which very different societies can come to understand each other's common aspirations and how the satisfactions of everyday life may be achieved. And it is certainly my honor to make sure that it keeps on going. Thank you. Perhaps I can uh, begin with a question myself, and uh, that would be the present climate in Washington is uh, one that features a lot of constraint Correct. financially. And I wonder whether uh, the International Education Exchange Program has been a target of people who have more zeal to cut budgets than they do to promote international understanding. Um, as far as I know, the Fulbright Program, to my surprise, has not been singled out uh, in, uh, to, uh, as, as something that should uh, be eliminated. Uh, so I think even those who um, forced the shutdown of the government, um, perhaps they thought it was too small, but they certainly did not single it out as one of the, their main uh, objections. Do you think that there's any possibility for an exchange program that could possibly bridge the divide between the two parties in Washington? <laughs> Uh, what a wonderful idea. And promote greater understanding <laughs> and harmony. Congress itself is supposed to be that uh, setting where they settle their differences. And in the past, uh, you know, a great deal of that work was done right in the halls of Congress. So certainly my husband worked very hard to make friends across the aisle and um, to even invite them to his home and uh, to uh, try to also 
uh, treat some of their complaints with, um, with comedy. I, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier at one point when one of them um, was ranting and raving about commies and how dreadful they are and why can't the government do more about them. Um, the senator, they were sitting uh, together in, in a, in a um, I, I don't know, in a room, and he looked at him and said, commies? Commies here? And he started getting up, and he looked under the furniture and said, commies? Where are they? And of course, the man felt very foolish and started laughing. And you know that, that then allowed him to, to speak about uh, you know, communism in more, much more realistic terms and bring the level of this shrill uh, conversation. He did that all the time. Now, we had a lunch today, actually, a very nice luncheon with a number of faculty members and staff mm -hmm. members of the university who uh, were telling us about their experiences abroad with the Fulbright program, one aspect or another. Um, and I found myself uh, thinking um, about your own international experiences. How have those shaped your view of the value of this kind of exchange? Well, mine started really very early. My father, who adored Fulbright once he met him, um, was an international businessman who believed very firmly in, in um, uh, learning early and, and uh, a lot about differing societies. And so at the age of 15, he uh, sent me um, to stay with friends of his who were Colombian and residents of uh, the country of Colombia. And for three months, I not only stayed there, I had two years of Spanish, so I had a sort of beginning smattering of the language. And they, as soon as I got to Colombia, uh, I w entered in the Gimnasio Femenino in Bogotá. And um, it was uh, an amazing experience uh, because once I, I, you can imagine, I studied massively hard to rapidly increase my, uh, my Spanish. And even after I could speak Spanish and, and um, uh, understand and and interact. Uh, the beginning of every class there uh, began with every student uh, in this fashion. And I still, even after learning the language, did not do that. And so finally, one of them came up to me and said, you know, wh why? You are understanding us. Why? And I said, because, and I said in Spanish, I'm Protestant. I'm not Catholic. And their eyes got this big. And they said, oh, do you believe in God? Uh, and that began a whole series of um, conversations, which I hasten to ha add um, showed my ignorance of them as much as their ignorance of, of the US. And it was an amazing summer. And that certainly, if anything, could have convinced me of the need for um, not just travel if it's Tuesday, gee, this must be Belgium, where do we go from here? What country? Really in-depth knowledge and interaction was vital in this, in this present day world. Uh, I would again invite my uh, colleagues in the audience to come and avail yourself of the microphone if you have a question. Um, in, the, in the story that you just told, uh, vivid in that experience was your struggle with the language. Yes. And I wonder how you feel about the current trend um, internationally for uh, universities abroad to offer instruction in English, even if that's not the language of the country. Eric. Well, I think that's sad. Um, I think that uh, we, unfortunately, English has, if there is an international language these days, it is English. And we get spoiled because we can speak English in places, in far more places than, than in countries that, whose language is English. And I think that makes us lazy, and I think that's too bad. Mm. We have a brave first question. 
so much for coming to speak with us today. Delighted. And one question I had for you, there's been so many Fulbright scholars over the years, whether as students or as professors, and I wondered, do a few stick out to you as using their experience to really jumpstart their career in something that really stuck out to you as memorable or important in the field of international diplomacy? Uh, who, uh, uh, what was mem uh, stuck out? The careers that they pursued after their Fulbright, if it was influenced in some way by what they learned during their time. I think it's not so much the, the, the type of career, whether you are you know, a doctor or a, a lawyer or a, you know, a government worker or whatever, but the manner in which you deal with that career, your outlook, that's what I think has been um, the fundamental benefit of, of the Fulbright program because having forced a student or a professor uh, to um, stay in a country long enough to have to find out why they have these different beliefs, why they're expressing things in a way that they're unfamiliar with, uh, makes you more sensitive to um, not only the reasons for differences, but um, how to deal with them without um, either dislike or unreasonable argument. Thank you. Thank you. Was a part of your question uh, also about the way in which people uh, capitalized on contacts made abroad and uh, turned those relationships into something uh, even more meaningful? Was yes. that part of your question? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, th I think that's very true because once they came back from their Fulbright, they certainly um, looked at their profession um, and and what they did with it in very different ways. Even though it was the same profession, they looked at it in, in very different ways. My own children did not have Fulbrights, but my youngest child uh, certainly spent um, uh, a whole semester in, in Mexico. And um, she is a very definite young lady. I mean, she's a real liar. <laughs> but it, it changed her so that she listens a great deal more and so that she uh, tries harder to understand, um, get at problems in different ways so that you, the understanding can be arrived at. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Now, if you were uh, to apply to study abroad somewhere yourself now, uh, where would you apply to go and why? That's a very interesting question because I have lived all over the world and I have spent two years in, in Korea and, and in Germany and um, in, in, um, obviously in, in Colombia. Um, I've spent a year in England, um, I, and so I'm not sure where I'd really want to go to study. Would but, you make that choice on the basis of uh, the place where you felt you needed to learn most or where you felt you needed most to be an ambassador? That's a, that's a wonderful question, and I think I would choose the latter because I think there are still parts of the world which are very much isolated from our way of life and, and our history and even our current events and need um, to know more about it so that they can um, even ask, they don't even ask questions, they just, you know, uh, abolish the idea, uh, and, and I would like to change that. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Yes. We yeah, have a second uh, question. Well, I have two rather minor curiosity questions. One, I don't remember which year the Fulbright was first given, the first year that someone received one. And also, uh, I was wondering, what year did uh, the senator pass away? OK. Um, the, the, the first part of that question, um, is that the program turned into law, I think it was in 1946, and I know that the first students uh, went from both shores, they went both east and west in 1948. 
And so that was the beginning of the program. And um, uh, my, my husband passed away in 1995. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fulbright. Um, the Fulbright Scholarship has supported so many musicians over the decades in their studies. And part of my dissertation concerns the effect of the Fulbright Scholarship on the construction of musical instruments, particularly pipe organs in the 1950s and 60s, thanks to returning Fulbright scholars from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious as to whether William Fulbright had any particular interest in music, or if music has just been one of the many beneficiaries of the program. It, it, music has been one of the many beneficiaries of the program. and. And uh, there have been numerous um, uh, the, the results of, in, of international um, organiz not just so much organizations, but international interchange uh, that, that have been maintained after a Fulbrighter has either come here or gone um, overseas. And, and um, some, lots of organ probably small organizations, but uh, have been formed as a result of the Fulbright program that maintain this, this constant interchange, which keeps up uh, and deepens the understanding that was first begun as a Fulbrighter. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I am a Fulbright grantee, so it doesn't really apply uh, to me, but what do you see as the challenges for the future? Because I can imagine, like, actually, if I want to, I can follow a course in China without any problems. I mean, communication is very easy. So it's a different setting than before in the 40s or the 50s, where people had to travel by boat, etc. So how do you see that globalization that is already uh, going on? How does it affect the Fulbright program, and what uh, direction is it taking? Are there any changes uh, on the policy then? And excuse me, was it a part of your question uh, something to, to do with the internet and the ease of yeah, uh, uh, interaction? Well, yeah, the my internet? question is uh, so Fulbright, it's being geographically somewhere else for a long period, yeah. but it, like the incentive to go somewhere else to study, it has gone because you can follow the courses over the internet anyway. So. I'm not sure whether you... Well, I, I think people realize, people who have uh, traveled or who have talked to Fulbrighters realize that, yes, the internet has certainly made a big difference, but there is nothing. I mean, it's like uh, looking through a keyhole at something as opposed to opening the door and going out and becoming part of, of uh, the scene. And, and those are two very different things. The keyhole shows you, it shows you something, but nothing like the whole view. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for speaking again. Um, so my question is kind of related to that in that um, I want to know if you believe there are any shortcomings of the program or any aspects of the program that needs to be changed to accommodate the evolving world or just the way that um, the world is set up now. That's a wonderful, wonderful question. And um, uh, I, I, I sort of preface the question with the fact that uh, both my husband, when he was alive, and I uh, m make uh, very clear that we have nothing to do with the, either the management or the decisions or anything about the program. Because as I've said earlier, it, it, you know, we felt like the gorillas sitting in the corner. <laughs> and furthermore, uh, we didn't want to dampen anybody's, um, uh, you know, suggestions and willingness to figure out what what uh, could be done. I feel that I, I wish the program were uh, bigger in numbers. And furthermore, I think that um, it's it should be not only the professors who teach subjects and the students, but those people who administer colleges, uh, for instance. Um, there should be a wider view of people who 
uh, are, can be very much a part of the program because these people are also influential uh, and, and need to have their eyes widened. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, this is my second experience as a Fulbrighter. I spent as a graduate student, and I'm now teaching at Berkeley. And one of the things that Fulbright gave us was uh, one of the things that kind of created bonds with my Fulbright friends today and even before, a couple of years before, was uh, a love for different kinds of food and cuisine. I mean, we, we've shared, uh, I, I remember my Russian Fulbright friends completely drove me crazy about curry and tandoori and everything else. And, they st and I, I paid them a return favor by asking them about borscht and everything else. So we've had these, and this goes on even now. So I was wondering, and this is, I mean, this is something that I've always thought about, and is that if you, if Senator Fulbright also shared a similar passion for cuisine and everything, I mean, it's of course not as easily available. And I've been responsible for telling them that Indian cooking does not only mean tandoori chicken. So that's always <laughs> been important. So that was something that I really wanted to know. Well, that's a wonderful example of the things that if you go to a country, you would learn a great deal more and not have this yeah. myopic view of, of uh, a food, which and food is very important. So yeah. that is a wonderful question. And again, it, it it makes me wish that the program, perhaps not so much as changed, but just got bigger. With, that we could send double, triple the number of of Fulbrights uh, of people for on Fulbright scholarships. I think it would make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I was wondering if I can ask you a question. I, before I ask the question, I found your reference to this notion of the communists very amusing, because beyond its political implications, which, which is of course something outdated and obsolete, there are no more communists invading America. There's a sense in which I think, despite the fact that full, the Fulbright program has been very successful, there is still resistance in the United States, not on the part of individual scholars, but the university system to receiving or being receptive to university systems from outside the United States, in particular as it regards continental European ideas. The Americans seem to have a sort of love-hate relationship to that which comes from countries like France, where mm -hmm. I'm educated, for example. Mm -hmm. And then I was just wondering, to the point that I simply have to remind Americans, referring sometimes my American friends, referring to the, to the work of David McCullough, that university education was not invented in the United States. I was just wondering if you can tell me, despite, in your view, how much this program has been successful, despite its individual successes in terms of opening the horizons of its individual beneficiaries, in, in terms of reforming the American academic system, opening it up, making it more receptive, and making it distance itself from some of its, unfortunately, in my view, ideological pretensions to, yes, to superiority. I totally in what understand sense do you think what that has, has been successful? I'd be grateful if you address that question. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, and I do feel that if we ha could only um, really increase the number of Fulbrights, I mean, at this point, I think for every uh, one Fulbright scholarship, there are yes. close to 10 people who have tried to apply. And uh, that does not mean that nine of them are not worthy. That's nonsense. Mm -hmm. I would think that um, the majority of them were, were worthy uh, of the scholarship. And if the majority of them had been able to go and see that half the things that they believed were either distorted mm -hmm. or not true at all, true. and uh, then true. we wouldn't be this knot of people that, that was up here, we would be far more widespread, and I think that would make a big difference. Hence your desire for expanding the program, I correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Uh, this brings to my mind uh, a question. The, the last couple of questions bring to my mind a question about uh, the political sensitivities of the countries where uh, Fulbright people go or, or come from. And I wonder, especially given the time when the program was set up, in the late 1940s, and 
the, the recent nature of the war and with enemies uh, to the east and to the west, mm -hmm. were there any uh, serious misgivings on the part of your husband's colleagues in uh, the Senate, for example, about, uh, let's say, having, having uh, people go to Germany or, or to Japan, we had so recently fought? Um, I think that actually, um, the number who, uh, certainly the number of Japanese and Germans who wanted to come here under Fulbright's was, was enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I certainly know that a lot of um, attitudes were, were softened, if not really changed, uh, as a direct result of their entering our uh, both uh, academic system, whether as a teacher or uh, as a student, um, or um, students going to those countries. Uh, and a lot of people especially went to Germany. Um, and I think not so many went to Japan simply because the language was even more foreign. Language. More difficult, uh, yes. Yeah. And I wondered, the same uh, could be said about uh, the Cold War, for example. Did, did, were there efforts, for example, to um, restrict the number of uh, people coming from, from the Soviet Union or going to the Soviet Union during the Cold War? Um, I, the, I think that there's been a, a love-hate situation in, mm. in, that, in that whole area. And furthermore, uh, a lot of people who, um, uh, it, it, as far as the Soviet Union goes, a tremendous number of, of people wanted to come from uh, the Soviet Union, and it was their government that stopped them cold, not ours, because they were totally afraid of uh, that, you know, that their eyes would be open to the fact that the majority of what they were saying about us was completely false. And having lived in the Soviet Union, and I did live in the Soviet Union uh, for a couple of years, um, they were terrified of that. Uh, I had two people um, follow me 24 hours a day because I did speak Russian. I made a point of learning Russian before I went. And um, when, I, when I got there, it, I, I was never, never left alone. And in, in many cases, they had ways of discouraging people from talking to me. But they didn't succeed altogether. And um, there was one time when I, I traveled to save my sanity. And there was one time when I went to Tashkent and um, the, the morning I arrived, I said, I'd like to go visit a school because I was a teacher. And they made me sit down. Uh, and they were going to ignore me, I'm sure, for the whole day. But after 15 minutes, I said, I am determined to stand here and make your life miserable until you give me the name of a school. And so, and so they, in fury, threw me the name of a school, which luckily was very close by. And when I went, of course, the school had no idea that I was coming. Um, and I attended classes. And in the, when the classes broke up, and uh, the teachers all gathered around, and we compared notes, which was fascinating because um, the teaching methods were so different. Um, th they asked me how, how I taught certain um, classes in terms, especially in terms of uh, uh, e English composition and so forth. I would often break up my classes in, in groups and have them work together. And um, the teachers there, they kept their classes lockstep together. And everybody had to learn at the same pace and the same time, and no questions asked. Discussion periods, minimal. This was just, I'm imparting to you what you know, and I don't want any questions. And of course, I was always asking for questions, and good teachers always ask for questions. 
So that was a, just a totally fascinating uh, conversation uh, to such an extent that I left there mid-afternoon and said, thanked them profusely, loved being at your school, really enjoyed talking to your teachers. And immediately, the student teachers who were there, they, began, they had begun to figure out who I was. So they went rushing to the headmaster and um, they said, we can't let this lady just leave and go back by herself. Then we will be rude. We have to accompany her back to her hotel. And the headmaster thought, oh, yeah, that's nice of you. Yes, go ahead. So this whole troop of, of student teachers went out to the sidewalk with me. And just as we got out and uh, to the curb, they said, where do you really want to go? <laughs> and uh, so, of course, I said, where do you want to show me? Well, we were out until 10 o'clock at night. And it was fascinating with discussions and, you know, showing me places in the city that I never would have seen on a tour. And finally, we ended up in the dorm room of one of the uh, students. And he rummaged around in his, his drawers, and he pulled out this really wrinkled, practically tattered magazine. And guess what it was? Time magazine. How he got hold of that, I don't know. But he shuffled, and he smoothed out one of the pages, and he said, do you see that picture? And it was a picture of an apartment building. I said, yeah. It was an American apartment building. And he said, do you see what the label is under there? And it said, slums. And I said, oh. And he said, we look at that building, and we think that looks like a really nice building. And in your country, that's slums? What else are they lying to us about? <laughs> and I thought, this is the end of this regime at one point. This is not going to last. <laughs> If you were to create a baccalaureate, would you stress more a generalized education, like in uh, America, where you start off being free to choose whatever you do at first, and, but at the stake of more standardized testing? Or would you have specialization already, like in Europe, you already start with a major from the, straight, from the first year? I think that I, I think that um, I, it would be r really hard to uh, create an education system here where it was uniform. I, don't you agree? I mean, I, I really um, the 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 fundamental disagreements about what education should be about uh, is. is it continues to this day, and I'm sure will keep on going. You would have to fight against uh, everybody's idea about what's best for their exactly. own children. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Which is a powerful uh, force, I think. Yeah, and what's most important to learn, and how to learn it. There are tremendous differences in those in those forces, and I don't see any way of overcoming those differences. Um, to, I mean, obviously there are certain real fundamentals, but those are few and far between compared to the differences in educational systems. Well, let me suggest that uh, we should draw to a close the question and answer part of the program. I would like to thank everyone for the questions. I thought they were very stimulating, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes tasty, <laughs> but uh, certainly very stimulating. And uh, I would like to ask the audience to join me in thanking Mrs. Fulbright. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it.